Hello and welcome to MF Corner. I'm Sumera Abdi. On the show today, we'll zoom out a bit and understand what are business cycles and why they matter to your mutual funds with Ashish Sumaya, CEO of White Oak Capital Management. And also amidst the flurry of NFOs, we'll take stock of whether old or vintage schemes still deserve a place in your portfolio with Kalpesh Ashar, a full circle financial planners. But first, let me invite Ashish Sumaya, CEO at White Oak Capital Management. Hi, Ashish. Thanks very much for joining in. Uh, you know, the topic today is very, very interesting because, you know, very often we have heard people in the norm and experts like your Yourself, say uh, that you know such and such fun uh, is going through uh, you know midway through a cycle we've also heard of people saying you know uh, or judging a fund managers experiencing you know so and so has seen only uh, two cycles has not seen enough uh, business cycles so therefore you know naturally a retail investor wants to know what is this business cycle and why does it matter to my mutual fund yeah, so, you know, uh, very interesting topic. I should compliment you uh, for that because, you know, it goes straight into the uh, basics. Uh, see, look, uh, business cycle is actually, in a sense, is actually related to the economic cycle. Uh, I have never been able to figure the right words for this in English. So I always uh, explain this with a couple of words in Hindi because in Hindi, people understand the right word uh, is teji and mandi. So, you know, when you look at it in uh, the economic terms, uh, the economy uh, usually goes through cycles of uh, growth uh, and slowdown. Uh, growth is what we call Teji and uh, slowdown is what we call Mandi. And, you know, like students of physics, uh, they can understand that, you know, uh, sometimes you see the electric current in a sine wave, right? So if you imagine the sine wave, it goes through crests and troughs. Uh, so the crest is more like a Teji, a period of economic expansion uh, when there is great uh, growth in uh, demand uh, and uh, GDP, and uh, of course, as a result of that, in corporate earnings as well. Uh, so you know, all uh, everything which contributes to an economic expansion uh, is the growth cycle, and then of course, uh, growth is always followed by rising demand. Uh, rising demand would result in rising prices. Uh, rising prices can result in uh, rising inflation, and as you and me know, uh, that rising inflation can make some part of the population. Uh, feel poor for no fault of theirs, uh, and that can, uh, can sometimes cause elections. So it's in the basic nature that you know a growth cycle is always followed by rising inflation, and then to tame inflation, uh, the Reserve Bank needs to start raising rates, thereby making money uh, dearer uh, and less uh, easily available, which again results, you know, sort of control inflation, you always end up in the end of a cycle, to control inflation, you always end up hiking rates. Uh, which results uh, in you know kind of engendering or you know taming the cycle or engendering a slowdown so growth is always followed by a slowdown and sometimes if you do a bad job uh, if the economy does a bad job of controlling the slowdown that slowdown can uh, nose dive into uh, depression also hmm. thankfully uh, other than the covid era we actually haven't seen uh, more like a man made uh, depression but yeah, that's the whole cycle for you. So from one uh, from one trough to the next crest and then back to the trough is what would uh, usually be one cycle. Mm. People related to uh, cycles in terms of funds and uh, businesses, but uh, in reality, a cycle is actually more related to the economy and the economic performance. Okay, so Ashish, I, I take the basic point, right? That basically it is the cycle, uh, uh, you know, of growth basically or... Uh, the lack of it. How is how would you measure it? I mean, how would you know which stage of a cycle uh, we're in currently? What are the indicators? I mean, when did the last cycle end? Why is in the next one beginning? So you know, one needs to be mindful of the lay of the land. Uh, that's where you know, as portfolio managers, we need to be mindful of the lay of the land. But let me also tell you that you know, uh, myself and my team, our founder and everyone at White Oak actually believes that macro is not something which one can successfully forecast and uh, if you are managing money in the stock market even if you really believe that you can forecast the macro uh, translating it into actual results for clients is a completely different matter altogether so one is is macro forecastable we find it hard to believe second is even if you can forecast can you benefit from it in terms of producing returns even further more uh, doubtful but anyway sticking to your question uh, how would I read where I am in the cycle of what is actually happening? So yes, there are certain uh, indicators. 
like for example the direction of interest rates uh, the direction of inflation or inflationary expectations actually uh, then you know stuff like credit offtake uh, then uh, banks you know credit to deposit ratio uh, then you know if you follow credit rating agencies then you know what is the proportion of uh, downgrades to upgrades or upgrades to downgrades mm. you know where is that trend going so i think all indicators of inflation interest rates and credit demand uh, they would be good indicators of where you are uh, in the cycle and you know i'll use this opportunity to take up something which is pertinent in the current environment where everybody seems to be fixated uh, on rising interest rates you know uh, what will happen if the rates start rising in india for instance and you have seen the bond market throwing some tantrums uh, after the budget mm -hmm. now if you really ask me uh, whatever my understanding tells me that if interest rates don't rise you know if you're bullish on the economy then you should be willing to accept that rates will uh, rise a little bit mm. right because that is a sure sign that you know rates going up is a sure sign uh, of uh, demand in the economy and the first indicator of an economic expansion is the revival uh, of demand uh, so yeah i mean these are some things which one must watch for so ashish you know even in uh, you know at times when uh, the economy is say not doing well right uh, there will be some sectors which are always doing well because you know i mean like say take the last one year right uh, uh, you know fmcg did well pharma has done exceedingly well so are there like parallel business cycles running yeah so uh, you gave examples of fast moving consumer goods and pharmaceuticals now of course most of the items which fall under these categories are considered to be staples you know meaning that uh, the fortunes or at least the demand for some of these items is not really linked to where you are in the economic cycle you know so daily consumables like uh, you know what we use for personal hygiene or some of the food items and of course uh, drugs and pharmaceuticals or sometimes even alcohol for instance uh, some of these things are not related to where you are in the economic cycle you know whether the economy is expanding or not uh, people do have certain habits of smoking or consuming alcohol people do have certain habits of consuming certain types of food products or fmcg items yes so clearly but now we'll look at the opposite example if you talk about say consumption of steel for instance if you talk about say power consumption if you talk about logistics so now these are some uh, areas which are inextricably linked to whether your economy is expanding or not expanding uh, and there are of course the former examples for, where, which you mentioned uh, they of course don't uh, synchronize as much uh, with economic uh, expansion or economic activity okay so now we have a fair idea ashish of you know what a business cycle uh, really is and uh, you know i mean perhaps a better word would be an economic cycle um now we want to narrow it down to why it matters for a mutual fund and actually mutual funds invest in companies which are undergoing this business economic cycle right but as a retail investor now how do i read it how will i know what is a business cycle my fund is uh, you know following which stage it's at and also more importantly when i i mean do i exit when its cycle is ending yeah so you know look this is actually one thing which you must always keep in mind that you know arithmetically a cycle is always mean reverting so if you are someone who believes that i can bet on cycles uh, you know because like uh, what is a cycle a cycle is basically trough to crest and crest back to trough now obviously whether you are riding the economy or a business cycle or your fund you want to go crest to trough but certainly you don't want to have trust uh, trough to crest back right so a lot of times i am personally not a fan of this whole business cycle investing kind of thought process because cycles by nature are mean reverting right so after the crest comes a trough and after the trust trough a crest will come so i wouldn't actually frankly if you ask me i wouldn't i would like to understand how this all plays out it's very intriguing it's very interesting one must know the law of the land but uh, i personally think that because it is mean reverting it is uh, fraught with danger Uh, also like you rightly pointed out there is an implicit assumption that you will time from the crest to the trough and you will ensure that from the trough to the crest you will be out of those sectors which will actually be impacted on the uh, way down and there you know i think uh, our belief uh, in our ability to time macros uh, is not that great and our belief in ability of others uh, to time macros is also actually uh, not that great so for example our team out here at white oak we ensure that we neutralize cyclical and non cyclical so we ensure that our portfolios are balanced and we have a fair balance of cyclical and non cyclical such that we are actually neutral to the business cycle 
and the returns are produced only from the underlying uh, businesses and their uh, earnings profile. So yes, uh, I, I you know I I know where you're coming from, and the question is very important. But uh, can you really time it? Uh, is the whole uh, issue. And second point is that just timing economic cycles is not enough. Then there is the whole stock market because stock markets will always lead and share price movements will always lead and lag. You know, yeah. I have seen that yeah. uh, when the when the when the growth cycle is beginning, there are many times markets uh, are leading those growth cycles, and many times markets have even given false starts and disappointed uh, people. And on the down cycle, there are many times one sees that the markets fail to predict the downside, and the markets actually lag the a downward cycle also mm. so very very difficult to forecast it's best to have a balanced portfolio okay an animal that you can't control right okay so i take your point best to have uh, you know perhaps a fund which has a balanced portfolio but nevertheless you know the large variety of funds would have different cycles right therefore how i mean is there an optimum way to bring it together in your portfolio see i think one of the ways look uh, like for example, I mentioned to you that our team uh, takes cognizance of the fact that we can't time it and hence we deliberately balance our portfolio for cyclicals and non-cyclicals. On the other hand, uh, there are very many respected investors who follow certain criteria for stock selection. So they say, look, some people might say that we only buy high ROE and high EPS, right? Uh, high growth companies and you know high ROEs, et cetera. Now they would have a portfolio which would end up being tilted uh, towards say pharma, FMCG, financial services, uh, and you know less of cyclicals and uh, more of uh, uh, slightly more you know secular kind of uh, businesses so they might actually end up with a portfolio you know this this gets manifested in a statistic called a portfolio beta so they might end up having a portfolio beta of 0 0.6 0 0.7 or 0 0.8 and there are very many managers who bet on you know the mean reversion or the cycle saying that okay now if the economy does well steel will do well cement will do well power consumption will do well uh, you know corporate facing banks will do well Companies which are highly leveraged might do well if liquidity is high and rates are low. So people who bet on these things, they might actually end up having a beta more like 1.1, 1.2. So what happens is that this gets what you were saying, how does an investor control for it? It gets manifested in the beta of the portfolio. Uh, so you, know, you need to then have funds of uh, you know, different styles. You, know, you need to have two or three funds in your portfolio, uh, which ensure that you are not geared to only one leg of the market cycle. Like if you see people who had defensive portfolios or low beta portfolios, they did very, very well when COVID hit upon us, but they've been doing very badly after the market recovered from COVID. So from an investor's perspective, like I'm repeating, but this gets manifested in the portfolio beta and they should be conscious which way of the market cycle the portfolio is actually treated for. Ashish, you know, it's uh, almost like whichever question I ask, the answer is always the same, which is have a balanced portfolio go for asset allocation. It doesn't matter what the question is. But yeah, see, uh, it's important because eventually we all want to generate our returns from the earnings profile and the quality of the companies that we buy. But when we are not mindful about macros, when we are not mindful about stuff like beta, what happens is that quite unknowingly, your portfolio bakes in uh, certain macro headwinds and tailwinds, which, you know, sometimes when the going is good, it benefits you. But one fine day you realize that, you know, when the tide goes down that, oh, okay, this is what was creating tailwinds and oh, now it's gone out of the window. So yes, you are right in concluding that it's best to have a portfolio which is balanced, best to have a portfolio which derives earning, which derives returns from the fundamentals of corporates and not from uh, implicit headwinds and tailwinds uh, of the macros. So basically, make a fund manager work, right? Uh, Ashish, just one final thing. How long would a cycle last on average? I mean, is there a, a defined time frame or an average or a rough estimate? Actually, none. I mean, none. Uh, you know, there are many, many theories where it's said that one cycle is seven to eight years or one cycle is 20 years. And there are many such theories out there, but there is no perfect science. In fact, if you really ask me, we haven't seen a cycle for the last uh, seven to eight years, probably, because right from 2014 till ILFS defaulted in 2018, we had a series of false starts, but there were quite a few dramatic interventions uh, in the economy, you know, some deliberate and some not so deliberate. And when ILFS defaulted and when we had this whole credit crunch and liquidity tightness 
and then COVID rounded it off. That kind of uh, broke the back, right? So if you ask me, I think a new cycle has begun after April, May, after COVID kind of precipitated a crisis. I can imagine that now we've begun a new cycle. But if you really ask me from 2012, 13 till 2018, there was no cycle. We were just go we were in the trough uh, for a very long time. It's just that from the trough, we made many, many false starts. That's how I would put it. But if you ask me a real example of cycle, maybe 2003 till 2009, that was a good cycle where we had a crest to the trough and from the trough back to the uh, from the uh, trough to the crest and from the crest back to the trough. Right, Tashish. Thanks very much uh, for explaining it uh, to us. But, you know, this is a topic where you could go on and on, but uh, nevertheless, we have to be cognizant of the time. So thanks much at the moment for joining in. We may tap upon you once again uh, to take this topic forward. Up next, Kalpesh Asher of Full Circle Financial Planners will join in to talk about the place that vintage funds uh, deserve in your portfolio. Stay tuned. Hi, welcome back to MF Corner. Did you know that there are 1,729 mutual fund schemes in existence as of February end? And we continue to see a large number of NFOs still. In fact, just last year, there were 115 NFOs. And, you know, being a new scheme, it is marketed very aggressively. And a lot of the times what we're seeing is that investors in ex uh, existing schemes are being asked to redeem their funds and then reinvest it in the new scheme with a new promise. Well, I'll, I have a lot of misgivings about NFOs, but that's a topic for another day. For today, let's talk about those old funds which are uh, being asked to redeem out of the vintage funds, uh, you know, Many of them have been left by the wayside, but do they really deserve to be dumped? Do they have a place in your portfolio? Kalpesh Asher of Full Circle Financial Planners joins in and he says that they definitely deserve a relook, don't you, Kalpesh? Absolutely, uh, Samira. And, uh, you know, this thought emerges from the idea that uh, uh, all the vintage funds, as you have rightly called them, at one point of time, whenever they have been launched, uh, they were always projected and, in fact, were uh, very meritorious funds, you know. And with all the due diligence by the AMCs while launching them, by the advisors, by the investors, to find a place in an investor's portfolio it took a lot of doing. Now, all those funds have been, you know, very uh, well managed by the AMCs, by the fund managers. But over the uh, years, we've seen that although the AMC business works in a way, they have to keep on adding newer schemes nothing against that and I'm not going to speak against that. But what happens is that these old vintage funds, which were at once a classic fund, you know, so we have funds like in our uh, AMC, uh, in our mutual fund universe, like the HDFC Top 100, or earlier the Reliance Growth, which is now the Nippon Growth, Franklin Blue Chip. At one time, these were the stalwarts in the AMCs uh, and the investors portfolios, you know. So now what has happened is that all these schemes uh, have somehow taken a back seat but it has never diminished the efficiency of these funds. So the question to ask here is that, although there's a new influx of NFOs, new schemes being launched, these old stalwarts, do they deserve to be dumped or they can still find a port, uh, place in your portfolio and stay there uh, for, for good? Because even the returns which we've seen over the years uh, since inception, and we are talking very precisely, Sumara, here about schemes which are uh, being launched more than 15 years and back. So even by the law of equity investing, when we say stay put for the long term, these funds, which were once the darlings of the investors, uh, still very, very rightly deserve a place in your portfolio. And I don't think that adding newer schemes, uh, you know, uh, would really uh, merit just out of uh, simple redemption or replacement methodology. So unless and until there is very, you know, appalling uh, requirement by a client, or there is a new theme being launched, or there is a new scheme, uh, which finds a merit, I don't think these funds uh, should have been overlooked. And even if you see the returns over the years, I think since inception, they've given returns in the, uh, you know, the very high 18, 20% CAGR over a 15, 20%, uh, a 15, 20 year time frame. So I think uh, these vintage funds uh, are as old as, uh, you know, old wine and uh, they deserve a relook. And in fact, I would say it's stay put with them. Okay, uh, Kalpesh, you know, uh, uh, because every fund has a, a certain way in which it is managed. So say you 
you know, have been an early investor in these funds, you've held on. What should be the proportion vis-a-vis -vis new schemes, right? Because new schemes, like you said, may come with a new flavor, may come with a new idea, may come with a new style of managing. So is there some optimum mix? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, all these schemes uh, which have been launched, uh, you know, the uh, tried and tested large cap, mid cap category, uh, over a period of time, if you see then there have been certain, uh, you know, uh, schemes which have been added, categories which have been added, like the flexi cap uh, category was added. So if there has been a reason to actually look at those categories for diversification purpose, or I think the most important part is if the client's portfolio or the profile required it, to achieve his financial goals, why not? But just if, if for example, if uh, Nepal growth, which has in fact grown from an uh, you know initial price of 10 rupees to 1600 today, I think 161 uh, times of uh, growth is super in that category in a mid cap uh, space. But now if a client wants to diversify, if he doesn't have a large cap at that point of time and he's then found a need through an NFO in a large cap uh, later on, he might as well do it. So it all requires the you know uh, the need and requirement of the client to add new schemes. If mm -hmm. not, then I think staying put with these schemes is is a sure shot. Uh, I think way to uh, enhance your portfolio. And also, if your yeah. advisor has had a look at it, then you could always take his opinion whether to limit your schemes to all these uh, you know uh, vintage funds or to keep on adding on to it. All right, Kalpesh, uh, our time was limited, but I think the point has been well made that the seniors uh, in the uh, mutual fund space uh, definitely deserve some time, space and energy uh, to be reconsidered. With that, we'll wind up on MF Corner. Thanks very much for watching. Do keep sending us your queries and do stay tuned. Closing Bell is up next.